have been some of the historical milestones in the movement that you want to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk from the Indigenous perspective instead of, you know, the whole movement overall, because I think that's really important to talk about how back in 1990, Two-Spirited People of the First Nations in Toronto was the very first Indigenous AIDS service organization in Canada. And that began, you know, that it, there's a lot that led up to it. They originally wanted to call themselves Gays and Lesbians of the First Nations. When they were meeting at the 519 Community Centre, 519 Church Street Community Centre in Toronto, and having meetings talking about, we need to do something about, about the HIV response, but it was also a Two-Spirit movement. So the Two-Spirit movement, and the indigenous HIV response were very much together and they grew up together and they're they're separate and different, but it's an impor important distinction to, to realize that Two-Spirit people were very, very involved um, very early on. I don't mean just the organization, but individuals, our citizens that are Two-Spirit. And, and Two-Spirits uh, incorporated in 1990 and, and then they realized that they could probably do work all across Ontario, but they didn't want to label it uh, as Two-Spirit um, um, provincially. So they uh, formed a working group called the Ontario Aboriginal HIV AIDS Strategy. And that working, working group spread across Ontario under my dear mentor, the late Laverne Monet. Um, and 10 years later, I find myself as the chair of the of the working group or the steering committee for OHAS. I was the uh, president of uh, Two Spirited People of First Nations on the board. And in in uh, in 2005, OHAS, as you know, Megan, OHAS incorporated, and I was the the very first president on the board of OHAS back then. Um, and I I need to also talk about the formation of CAN, the Canadian AIDS Society (CAS) or CAS. You were in the late 80s was whole, making space for indigenous people to talk about HIV. And during those meetings, we they, not me, realized that they needed a national indigenous organization. And originally they were going to call it the National APHA Network, the National Network of, of Aboriginal People Living with HIV and AIDS. And it, it, it struggled to get going until the realization came, we need the whole family, everybody need all our relatives, all the, all the researchers and the academics and the, and the um, organizational leadership, they all needed to be on board for this to be successful. So in, in um, 1997, CAN, the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network was formed. And since then, they've been doing a lot of work. They started doing research. They started doing harm reduction. They've come a long way to the point where they've expanded, like many uh, AIDS service organizations, into sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. They also do TB. They do mental health and aging as it relates to all those issues. And they changed their, formally changed their name a couple of years ago to Communities, Alliances, and Networks. So that's my piece. Thanks, Trevor. And Renee, are there um, some historical milestones that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, so um, in Ontario, uh, they were, uh, uh, there were a group of educators who had come together and eventually formed a, a group called the Ontario First Nations HIV AIDS Education Circle. Uh, but Early on, uh, it was two educators, one that was from Nishinaabe Aski Nation and another from Grand Council Treaty 3, who were looking at the uh, education around HIV. And it was, wasn't really a great fit uh, for the communities because uh, the communities just weren't uh, fully understanding how, how they were doing the education. And so, he developed a tool called the uh, HIV Teaching Turtle. And from that tool, he really talked about uh, HIV in a holistic and circular fashion. And it really resonated with communities and the young people especially were understanding and understanding the importance of why this message was important. And so they uh, eventually got together with other educators from different uh, provincial territorial organizations and decide to form an education group that would help them share resources that were being developed so that they would have more of um, 
uh, <clears throat> more of a, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to think of the word, um, a cohesive uh, 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 list of facts that were coming out. And so they really uh, worked on trying to build on that. Uh, and now they're, now they're called the Ontario First Nations HIV AIDS Education Circle. And they do a lot of activism, including talking about uh, World AIDS Day and Indigenous AIDS Awareness Week. They're, 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 they cover the First Nations communities, right? So yeah. they're, they're funded by the, uh, the federal government through, uh, uh, and uh, to, to bring education and awareness to First Nations communities. So they work within that jurisdiction, right? Yeah, and you know, uh, that in itself is uh, important when we're talking about things like uh, World AIDS Day and Indigenous AIDS Awareness Week, because uh, the importance of the activism around that, the importance of understanding those jurisdictional barriers that are caused, those perceived borders that uh, don't necessarily exist for Indigenous people, but the government structured it in a way and it creates challenges. Uh, challenges for people living with HIV and people uh, trying to access care. Uh, it, it creates, uh, you know, challenges uh, with that. And so it's really important to understand, uh, you know, the differences uh, in the work that OHAS, uh, Two Spirits and CAN does, uh, and the work that uh, 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 the Ontario First Nations HIV AIDS Education Circle does. It's uh, it's really trying to work in partnership and address some of those barriers for people living with HIV. Great, thank you. And thanks for helping us unpack that a bit more, Doris. Uh, 